All right, this morning we are getting into uh, a, a further uh, sermon, a further message uh, on the, the race. And as you'll see in the bulletin there, I put it down as the race continues. Um, I could say the race part two, but if there's a part three and four and, and such and so forth, I thought it best just to go ahead and make it uh, that way. Uh, we are talking about, if, uh, if you remember, from last week, and I hope you do, we are talking about uh, Paul's description of the Christian walk, the Christian life, uh, the process of maturity, and Paul's uh, words that he uses, the way he describes that is he talks about this race that he has been in, he is in, and he's urging us to run the race. Let me grab my Bible. And uh, I wrote down a few notes from uh, last week. I'm only going to touch on those uh, very, very quickly because most of you all were here, and I don't need to rehash everything. But we talked last week about uh, the race and the concept of running the race. Uh, some of us who aren't great runners, <laughs> maybe have never run track uh, or anything like that, we say, well, I don't understand. Why is Paul talking about this race? that he's running, or that we're supposed to be running. And we talked about his exposure to uh, the games that would have been going on in his time, in the, in the New Testament time. There were a number of them, about four or five different uh, types of games. The two most prominent games would have been uh, the Olympics, uh, as you're familiar with, although these would have been referred to as the original Olympics or the ancient Olympics. The modern Olympics didn't start uh, about 150 years ago, not quite 150 years ago. Uh, but the bottom line is they had Olympics in that day as well. They also had a number of uh, a game that was held every two years, and those games were referred to as the Isthmian Games. And, and, and Paul, and when he writes especially to Corinth, to the church and to the believers in Corinth, he's probably referring to and making them remember the Isthmian Games, which were held every two years. And it would have been that isthmus, I have trouble saying that, isthmus that, that is Corinth is on. And uh, I also spent a little bit of time talking about the origin of the marathon. And, and we're familiar, if we watch the news, you've heard of the Boston Marathon, and you've heard of other marathon races. And that originated prior to Paul's time, prior to Jesus' time, in this battle that was fought at a place called marathon. And the Greeks uh, were winning the engagement, they were winning the battle, and as they were preparing to kind of push forward and, and, and defeat their foe entirely there at marathon, one of the individuals saw uh, a, 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 a ship that was the enemy ship and it was turning away from uh, the area there around marathon and it was heading toward the capital and it was heading down to, to announce, he thought, uh, that the others, the, the enemy, in fact, had, had won the day. They were going to go to the capital city. They were going to claim that they had, in fact, won the war, won the battle, and start claiming uh, Greek property and, and, and maybe coming in and making a shambles of the capital. So this individual, uh, Philippus, uh, or, or, or it's a close pronunciation of his name, decided that he would run all the way from... from uh, marathon to the capital city and it was just about 25 miles and he delivered the message we have won and then he fell <laughs> to the ground and he he passed away he died and so this marathon this race which now is a little over 26 miles it's run and it was originally run after that as a memorial to this this soldier and this runner, this individual who came to bring the victorious news. Now we just think a marathon. Okay, that's about 26 and a quarter or so miles. It takes more than a couple of hours typically for folks to run it, and it's a major, uh, a major race. And, and the reason I bring that up is it would have been run on a regular basis, and Paul seems to talk about this race that he's discussing as being a, a long-term race a marathon or an ultra marathon. It, it involves really the rest of our life 
as a Christian, once we have come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, then we're entered into this race. And the question is, how are we running this race? And Paul uses analogies and he uses descriptions to talk about running. He also mentions, as I mentioned last week, uh, the idea of like boxing, which also would have been a, a big important part of these Isthmian games. And he uses these different analogies to encourage, to describe, and to um, bring to life this concept of the Christian life as a race. And, and there's some very good points that he made. Uh, and I finally ended last week with that brief description of Romans chapter 11. And that is referred to as we know it as uh, the hall of fame or the hall of faith chapter. Because in Romans uh, uh, 11, we have that great list of those patriarchs and those individuals in the Old Testament who represent faithful Believers, believers who believed in God, believed his word, and it was counted unto them, it was reckoned unto them for righteousness sake. In fact, it begins with Cain and Abel, and it mentions Abel and says, look, Abel made this sacrifice to God, and he did it by trusting God and taking him at his word and offering an acceptable sacrifice that God had told them would be accepted by him. That was the way of faith. And the sacrifice back then is talking about the animal sacrifice. And it goes all the way up through and lists all the patriarchs and talks about David and, and Moses and it even mentions Rahab the harlot. Well, why would it mention her? Well, because she acted on faith. She, she heard the word of Jehovah. She heard the testimony of the spies who were sent into the land when the 12 went into the land, and, and in this case, when um, the individuals uh, went to go spy on uh, Jericho, and she hid them. She believed in Jehovah God and in the power of their God, and she trusted and she put her full faith and confidence in Him. And again, it was counted unto her. It was seen as faith. It was attributed her, to her as righteousness. Because if you, if you really consider uh, the, the book, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Hebrews, I've been saying Romans, the book of Hebrews 11 and 12, it's really talking about faith. And it's talking about the life of faith. And it even goes so far as to say, without faith, we can't please God. And so after the author of Hebrews, notably Paul, after he describes and talks about and lists all of these individuals, he begins in the 12th chapter by saying, and since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, well, what's he referring to? He's referring to all of the believers who have gone on before, especially these that, that every, every Jew is going to know. Every uh, person who's coming out of the Jewish heritage is going to know these folks. They're going to, when you say Moses and David, when you talk about Abraham, they're going to know these individuals. They're going to know that they, it wasn't the, the physical sacrifices that they made to God. It wasn't the animals that were, the blood was shed. It was what? It was by their faith. It was through faith that they knew God, that they trusted God, and that they obeyed God. And that that faith in God, even though they would never see in their physical lifetime, they would never see Jesus Christ, but they believed the Lord and trusted in Him and trusted in the promise of a Redeemer, trusted in the promise of a Messiah. And so as Paul is talking to us here, and, and he, he says, all these individuals, all these great faith champions, he said, the world wasn't worthy of them. I quote in chapter 11. He said, they wandered in deserts and on mountains and hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith that they did not receive what was promised. In other words, what he's saying, they never saw Jesus Christ. They never experienced him. But the promise of God's salvation, right? And the promise of heaven was there. It was made to them. So they believed in something they could not see. And in fact, that's the way he, he really begins this chapter 11. 
because he's talking about it, he says in chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. And then he goes on to, to start listing all of these ancestors, all of the patriarchs of the faith. So, how does that relate to the race? Because in chapter 12, he starts talking about us running the race. He says, so, therefore... You ever heard a preacher say or a teacher say, if you see a therefore in Scripture, find out what it's there for. That's, that's pretty clear. Well, he's just talked about all of these great heroes of the faith, men and women who trusted God, who with their physical eyes, they never saw Jesus Christ. They never saw the, the, the reward, the promise of salvation, but they knew that it was not over when their body took its last breath, that they were going to pass away, they were going to die, with the case of all of them save Enoch, who was translated. Uh, and, and the bottom line is they were going to, to, to pass away physically. Their body was going to stop, but their spirit was going to be with the Lord. And one day they would experience Jesus Christ face to face. And, and what he's saying is, he says, that's the pattern. That's the way to please God. How? What's the one word? By faith. You know it. You know it. So if we're called and we're going to run this race, we're going to run it by faith. And so that's what he says in chapter 12. Therefore, because of all of these things we know about the patriarchs, because of all these things we know about, he would have said probably the fathers, or he could have said the fathers and the mothers, you know, those who have gone on before. And by the way, the great cloud of witnesses, who else does it include besides the patriarchs? My family, your family, our loved ones, the witnesses are those who have gone on before. If they believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, then where are they? Their, their bodies, their remains may be in a grave somewhere but their spirits are with God. They're in the presence of the Lord. And they are also part of that great cloud of witnesses. And we said, those witnesses observe us, see what we do. They are encouraging us. It's like the great Colosseum as they sit in the stands of the Colosseum and they're cheering us on. Not only that, when we read this scripture in this passage, we said that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith, right? And, and I mean, I, I interpret that to mean none of us come to know Jesus. None of us come to know God by our own, our own volition, by our own choosing. We don't go, well, Jehovah. Oh, that sounds like a good name. There must be a Jehovah around. There must be a God that I need to pray to. He must have sent his... No, we come to God because his Holy Spirit begins the process of drawing us. Because we, he gave us a conscience, and within that conscience is the spark of the image of God. That sense of right and wrong. And then we begin to hear, like the word, we begin to hear the gospel. We begin to hear part of God's word. And maybe we hear a preacher somewhere or a teacher somewhere, or we encounter a, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they're different somehow. They're running this race, and it stands out, and it looks different. They're, they're, they're not like every other person in this world. They don't seem to be out for number one, right? They don't want to win the race at all costs. I asked you a question last week. At the very end, I said, who are we competing against in this race? It's kind of a trick question. Who are we competing against in this race? Satan? Is that what somebody said? No. Our, our, ourselves, I think, is the real answer. What? Well, yes. Because when Paul talks about this, when he discusses it, he says, in essence, uh, you have to be disciplined. You have to have uh, control, self-control, self-discipline. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about controlling our, our desires and our urges, and the old man, that part of us that is about our old nature, 
and we need to consider that part of ourselves to be buried, right? Died and buried and then raised up in Jesus Christ. He says things like, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, and it kind of it kind of throws us off because he says, "Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it." And that might make you think, "Okay, I got to get ahead of all my brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? Maybe if I knock them down, they won't get ahead of me." No, that's not what he's talking about. Because what he's saying is, if you're an athlete and you're running a race like that marathon. In a sense, everybody's running against each other, but really, if you talk to a, a, a runner, a marathon runner, they're not particularly competing with everybody else. They're typically running against those things they have done in the past, the, uh, the records that they have set, the accomplishments, their own time. So if they said, I did it in two hours and two minutes, I'd really like to finish this marathon in just two hours or under two hours. We're competing with ourselves. And when he says, if only one person is going to win a prize, you should push yourself to win the prize. He's saying your determination, your effort, you should take it wholeheartedly. You should be like an athlete who says, I'm going to train and train and train, and I'm going to build up my endurance. Endurance is a great word. We're going to train and we're going to, we're going to get to the point where we're prepared to run the race. Well, what is the race? It's life. It's the Christian life. So it's the race and engaging in activities of the Christian life that please God. So like Paul, when he says, in the first part of this passage you find in your bullet, he says, to the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. And so what he's saying is, he's saying, my goal, primary goal for me, is to share the gospel with people, to tell them about Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I think like a weak person, and I react like a weak person if I'm talking to someone who is weak, i.e., they either don't know Jesus Christ or they're a brand new Christian and they're struggling, right, in the very first days of their life as a Christian. He says, I try to get on their level. You know, he says, if it's a Jew that I'm talking to, I'm going to think like a Jew. Well, he's got a lot of background in that. He says, if it's a poor person, I think like a poor person. He said, if it's a, a rich person, I think like one who has been granted great riches. He says, I'm going to be all things to all people so that I might save some. So that's a part of the race. So what does that mean to us? How does that translate? Well, it means if we have friends, if we have relatives, if we have neighbors, we need to get to know them. We need to understand them. We need to know where they're coming from. And when we talk to them about our faith, we talk to them about the Lord, we share scripture with them, we need to think in ways that would make sense to them. I've heard it told, you know, about a guy that had a neighbor and he was trying to witness to him and that guy was in construction. He built houses. And so the guy tried to go over and strike up a conversation with him and he said, you know what? He said, uh, he said, I have a boss that's a carpenter. Can I talk to you about it? Well, he kind of got the guy's attention, right? Because that's in the building trades. And then he was able to talk to him about Jesus Christ. But it's the fact that we have to get on the level and be understanding and show compassion and meet people where they're at. That's what Paul, it's part of what Paul is saying. I will also tell you this, when non-Christians, when those we're trying to witness to, when they're having crisis in their life, what do they need to see out of Christians who are around them? They need to see compassion and love, and we need to pray for them. We need to reach out to them in their time of crisis. Why? Because it seems like when we go through those struggles in our life, if we, even if we're a non-Christian, we're more open to the gospel. You know, you know, Jesus said, if you hand somebody a cold cup of water in my name, that's an act of service. That's an act of running the race. If we show love and compassion to others. I when I had a bakery and I ran this bakery for about five years, I don't know that I had anybody who came into that bakery. And I didn't always ask them, are you a Christian? You know, because that wasn't the appropriate thing to ask if they're walking in looking for donuts necessarily. 
But if they were having a difficult time, and, and I said, how are you or how are you doing? And they shared something heavy. I said, can I pray for you? I don't think I ever had anybody say no. We can pray for those who come to us, that come into our circle, into our contact. So Paul's talking about witnessing, right? He's talking about um, showing kindness and, and, and love and compassion to others. He's talking about uh, the acts that he engages in. He also talks about a struggle, right? He says in here, he says, uh, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. He's talking about discipline, self-control. Well, there are spiritual disciplines that we should be engaged in. It isn't necessarily wind sprints, which I don't want to talk about because it's, it's a pain, you know, wind sprints, running really quickly or up and down stairs. Or, no, he's talking about things like prayer, things like spending time in God's Word. He's talking about things like meditation, where we take a passage of Scripture and not only do we read it, but we try to memorize it, we try to take it in, and then we try to meditate on it. We, we ask God to reveal its full meaning to us and how to apply it to our lives. Okay, And he's talking to us about all of these things as far as how we can run the race. In 1 Corinthians 4, starting at verse 1, and I'm going to be wrapping up here, he says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. What? He said, For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. What's he talking about? He's talking about not judging others, not finding fault and condemning and judging others. Paul was under the microscope, and yet he said, I don't, it's a small thing if you look at me and you judge me and you find me unacceptable. He said, because it's God who judges me. And he said, at this point, I don't put myself under the microscope all the time either. He says, I don't really judge myself because I'm not aware of any gross sin, any major hindrance, any stumbling block for anybody. He said, I'm aware of no sin in my life right now at the moment. Now, if we're not careful, we're going to say, wow, sounds like Paul is an ultra-marathoner, and how can I ever even get started in the race? You know, get down in those blocks and put my feet down there and, and get down in that stance. How can I even start? Because he's talking about all this righteousness and, and being found faithful and everything, and, and we might be really scared. There's only one problem with that, and that is Paul is not saying he's, he's accomplished it, that he's reached perfection, that he's reached spiritual maturity. What he is saying is he's striving to be like Jesus Christ. At other times he even says, look to me as I follow Jesus Christ, because that's the one that we pattern our life after. But Paul's saying, I'm striving to do that daily, and if you need a physical representation, he said, you can pattern yourself after me. And this is what he also says. I put this one in because I thought we might get worried that we'll never achieve it and we might just give up. In Philippians 3, he says, I'm going to start with verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Boy, that sounds impressive. I don't know if I can do that. And then Paul stops and he says, wait a minute, verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. So what he's saying is, he's saying, I'm not perfect. He says, don't hold me up and don't hold me to too high a standard, and don't get from me that I think I've got it all together, that I'm mature, totally mature and perfect. He says, no. He said, I haven't attained that yet. That's the truth. We won't attain Christ-likeness in a way that's really significant and meaningful. We'll strive for that and we want to be more like Jesus Christ, but we're not going to look just like him or nearly like him or that much like him until heaven. And Paul is saying, 
Don't worry if you stumble, if you fall in the race. Why? Because God the Father made you and created you, and He knows what your form is. He knows you're going to fall. But what should we do? We should get back up, brush ourselves off. If we sinned, we need to ask God for forgiveness and get back into the race. All right, that concludes this portion of this message. We will have a couple more, I think, on the race. Um, we are going to have prayer, and then we'll sing our closing hymn. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Paul's description of the race. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we understand that, that we don't, Lord, please you unless we live by faith. And that's really what this race is, is all about. And Lord, we're not competing against each other. We're striving to follow Jesus Christ and to be more like him. And Lord, when we stumble and fall, God, we just need to immediately come to you and, 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 and open up our hearts and confess if there's any sin when we stumbled. And, and Lord, ask for forgiveness that we might be cleansed and then get back in the race. Help us to be more aware and a greater understanding of what it means to compete with our whole heart, to give all our energy and all our time and just to push ourselves, Lord, to qualify and then to win this race. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.